Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the Apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, 
When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. <clears throat> it is time to take a breath. I mean that both literally and figuratively. As we continue to observe safety measures during the pandemic, breathing is a significant issue. <clears throat> I'm feeling it myself this morning for some reason. And speaking for myself, I really don't mind wearing a mask when I go out. At least I don't mind the idea of wearing a mask. It seems to me that anyone who cares about health and safety of those around them really ought to comply with this simple measure without fussing. And happily, it seems that most people around here do. That's not to say that there are no problems with wearing masks. As one who wears glasses, in order to function in most situations, I've struggled with fogged up glasses. And I've tried any number of different masks to try to fix the problem. At least warmer weather has brought respite from that. I also have a bit of a problem when I am doing what you might call solo work, as in preaching a sermon where I am talking continually. If I'm wearing a mask, I find myself short of breath. So I'm glad that I can dispense with a mask as long as I stay up here and you stay out there. I'm sure we all have similar issues. So in quite a literal way, I think we all feel a need take a breath. Needless to say, masks are just one part of the stress and strain we felt for the past year. Our lives have been restricted in so many ways. We've been locked down in our homes. We've been locked out of church and businesses. We've been denied the ability to travel or even to run ordinary errands. And have generally felt like the air has been sucked out of our lives in so many ways. Many of us desperately want to take a breath, both literally and figuratively. So when we read that Jesus appeared to the disciples and breathed on them, I think we can relate very personally. Although the circumstances are quite different, I think this might give us a better understanding of how the disciples might have felt. Their time with Jesus over the previous three years had been exhilarating, then his crucifixion delivered a gut punch that left them gasping for air. Under voluntary lockdown in the upper room where just days before they had celebrated the Passover with Jesus, their lives were shattered. They had no idea where to turn. They were frightened, confused, and disoriented. And then Jesus appeared. And the Gospel tells us 
he breathed on them. The soft breath of their teacher changed the atmosphere in the room immediately. Peace be with you, he said, and their fears and anxieties receded. They didn't yet see the way ahead, but they had a sense that maybe there was a way ahead, like the cool evening breeze that relieves the oppressive heat of a summer day, the breath of Jesus brought a new perspective, the beginnings of an assurance that all would be well. They didn't yet realize how transforming this breath would be. In the moment, they were still too focused on their present situation to realize what power there was in this breath. The calm it brought at that moment was enough. But this was more than a momentary sensation or a temporary respite. For in truth, this was the spirit, the wind, that moved over the face of the waters of creation and brought order out of chaos. This was the breath of God that gave life to Adam when God created him out of the dust of the earth. This was the breath that God breathed into the dry bones of Ezekiel's vision, giving them life again. This was the wind that Jesus described to Nicodemus that goes where it chooses, even when we do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Furthermore, this was the breath that Jesus promised would come again in 50 days on the day of Pentecost, that mighty wind of the Spirit of God which would give new life to the community described today in the reading we heard from Acts. This new community really was different. It didn't look at all like anything that had come before. When the new normal emerged, it emerged not as a copy of anything they had known in the past, but as something entirely new. I suppose that I have been as guilty as any preacher of putting all of the emphasis on this Sunday every year on Thomas the Doubter. The problem with focusing on Thomas is that Jesus certainly doesn't hold Thomas up as an example to imitate. What he says is, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. It's a negative lesson. Don't be like Thomas. That's not to say that Thomas is in any way at fault. All of the other disciples had a leg up on Thomas and on us when it comes to faith in the resurrection. They were there when Jesus first appeared. As John says in today's epistle, they saw with their eyes and touched with their hands. The eyewitness accounts of the disciples are important, of course. An eyewitness account is about as close as you can get to historical proof. But the truth is that even eyewitness accounts differ. They don't always agree, and as soon as there is an element of disagreement, there's going to be an element of doubt. In the Old Testament law, to convict someone of a breach of the law, two witnesses had to agree. The very fact that two witnesses are required suggests that the word of one eyewitness cannot be entirely trusted. And if two eyewitnesses disagree, where does that leave us? There were eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus. John urges us to believe them, but even his urging testifies to the fact that some still will not believe, like Thomas. The other disciples saw and touched and believed, and they told Thomas. They were his friends, people he trusted, and still he didn't believe until he saw for himself. So why should we be any different? The answer is the church. The church is why we should believe. And that's why we have this first reading from Acts today. It describes the church, this new community born out of the breath of the risen Lord on the disciples. He breathed on the disciples and gave them new life. 
In their preaching, they shared that breath with those who have come after. And from that, we have the church. The proof of the resurrection is not the various appearances of Jesus to the disciples. The proof of the resurrection is the church, which continues to witness to his presence within it, sometimes seen, but mostly unseen. It is the ongoing life of the church that proves that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And it is the existence of the church that enables that witness to continue. If it were not for the church, this living and breathing community of people who believe in the risen Lord, you and I would never have heard of the resurrection or experienced the unique life which God has given us through the breath of the risen Lord. There's an interesting liturgical action, which most people may not even be aware of, which can remind us of this important truth. The rubrics of the prayer book don't require it, so it isn't practiced by all clergy. But I recall a Bishop of Albany who put great emphasis on it. Bishop Wilbur Hogg was our bishop when I came to the diocese in 1978, and he always presided at the great vigil of Easter at the cathedral. In those days, we always had baptisms at the Easter Vigil, and Bishop Hogg would bless the water. There's a point in the blessing of the water where the celebrant is directed to touch the water. But Bishop Hogg went further. He also breathed on the water. He made the letter psi, which is the first letter of the word for spirit in Greek. We become Christians by being baptized. We become members of the church by being baptized. We are baptized into the death of Jesus and raised to new life in the community, the church, formed by the breath of his spirit. After the horrific events of Good Friday, the disciples needed to take a breath. They were all gathered together, all except Thomas. Life had virtually stopped for them. They needed to start breathing again. And that is what happened when the risen Lord appeared to them in their lockdown in the upper room. Jesus breathed on them. And in that breath, the church began to breathe. The life-giving breath of the risen Lord came at a critical moment. Having been with Jesus throughout his ministry, having heard him teach, and even having heard him explain that he must die and rise again, these things were not enough to sustain the little community that had formed around him. They needed to take a breath. When they did, amazing things began to happen. Genesis tells us that God breathed into Adam just once. And from that one breath, Adam became a living, breathing human being. But one breath was not enough. One must continue breathing in order to stay alive. In the same way, Jesus breathed once on the disciples. And from that one breath, the living organism known as the body of Christ, the church, came to life. But again, one breath was not enough. The church must continue breathing, living the life of the risen Lord who dwells within us, passing that breath and that life on to new generations of Christians. As we slowly emerge from the restrictions of the pandemic, we have new challenges ahead of us as the church. With our doors closed and our life largely restricted to contacts via mail, the telephone, and the internet, it may have appeared to outsiders that we were virtually out of business. But then again, when Christians through the centuries gathered underground in homes and catacombs and other secret places to avoid persecution, some may have thought then that the church had been destroyed. 
And most importantly, when the disciples were hiding out of the upper room after the execution of their leader and friend, some may have thought that the Jesus movement had come to an end almost before it had even begun. But when we read today's gospel, we are reminded that it only takes one breath to give new life. We need to take that breath. A breath that we do not take on our own, but a breath that is given. A breath that has power to overcome chaos. A breath that has power to give life to every human being. A breath that has power to breathe new life into dry bones. A breath that has power to make a new community and a new world. A breath that comes from one who knows what it is to die and who knows what it is to live again. We are his body. We share his life. We share his power to make all things new. All we need to do is take a breath. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the offices. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess thy name may be united in thy truth, live together in thy love, and reveal thy glory in the world. <clears throat> Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as thine own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to thy honor and glory. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of thy salvation. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We commend thy mercy all who have died, that thy will for them may be fulfilled. We pray that we may share with all thy saints in thy eternal kingdom.
Lord, in thy mercy. Hear and hear. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for that thou hast delivered us from the dominion of sin and death, and hast brought us into the kingdom of thy Son. And we pray thee that as by his death he hath recalled us to life, so by his love he may raise us to joys eternal. Who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and giving life to those in the tomb.
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Thanks be to God, alleluia, alleluia. 